Well, good evening. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Lyndon. I'm, uh, as was said, a pastoring in Toronto on the east side, a uh, church called Christ Church Toronto. And it's my privilege to open up the word with you all this evening. I'm trying to see if there's anybody upstairs. No, I don't have to make eye contact up there. Good. Uh, this evening, we're going to be opening up the Old Testament prophetic book of Jonah. And we're going to be reading together the first chapter, Jonah chapter 1, in its entirety. Uh, so I don't know if you turn in your Bibles or if you have it up on the screen. I guess it's up on the screen. There it is. Who needs a Bible anymore anyway? No, that's a joke. We, we do need our Bibles. Okay. We're going to begin in uh, verse 1 of chapter 1 in, of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to, uh, do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It's quite a story. It is a startling introduction to one of the great literary masterpieces of the Hebrew Bible. The prophet of God, called by God, directed by God, fleeing from God. Jonah hears the word of the Lord and runs. It seems preposterous. How does somebody, a prophet no less, hear the word of the Lord and run away? It is an idea that I've heard from many, from Christians, Muslims, atheists, agnostics. And it goes like this, if I heard the word of the Lord, if God spoke to me, came to me, made himself clear to me in terms of what he desires me to do, I would listen. 
I'd obey. I would follow. Wouldn't you? Well, the story of Jonah gives us reason to pause. And what the story suggests is that perhaps it isn't so simple and perhaps we aren't so good to presume that if we really knew what God wanted us to do, we would simply do it. Because is it the case? Is that the case? Or is it the case that we humans are simply the kinds of creatures who when we hear the word of the Lord, especially a hard word from the Lord, we run, we run. Now we can all say that we would obey if we had been in Jonah's shoes, but here's the thing. What happens when this God actually shows up in your life (laughs) and speaks to you a word that's hard, calls you to do maybe the very thing that you don't want to do, uh, the very thing that you're most afraid of doing, something that seems too difficult for you to actually go and do, what will you do when you know that God is not pleased with particular patterns of thinking? When you know that God is not pleased with things that you're doing on the daily basis, right? things you're looking at, the way that you speak to others, the way that you treat others, when you know, how do you respond when you hear a word from the Lord? When you know what you ought to do, do you do it? All the time, faithfully, in every way. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. But Jonah rose to flee from the presence of the Lord. Now, it's worth noting at this point, especially for those who are less familiar with the Bible generally, that the story of Jonah presupposes the kind of world where God speaks. Maybe we all know this. Perhaps we all know this here. Uh, the, the, the whole of the Bible presupposes this kind of world. It's, it's a world where God actually speaks and engages with his creatures. He's, he's spoken. He is speaking. And more than that, it presupposes the kind of world where God has spoken to you, is speaking to you. As the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world, God has spoken. Or as it says in Romans 1, for what can be known about God is plain, because God has made it plain in the things that have been made. You may deny that there is a God, and you may deny that God has spoken. But according to the scriptures, all such claims are disingenuous at best. Because as those made by God, for God, in the image of God, in God's world, uh, full of the, the fingerprints of God, we know, we know, and we've heard, at least enough to honor God as God and to give thanks to him as our maker. And the only question left then is whether or not we're listening. This is the question, one of the questions that we're pressed to consider here in the story of Jonah. Whether or not we're listening. God has spoken. God is speaking. Are we listening? Are we willing to hear? Or whether we, like Jonah, whether we too are on the run. But then here's the thing. It turns out that when it comes to running from God, none of us is exempt. According to the broader scriptural narrative, what the scriptures themselves testify against each of us is that we all, like Jonah, don't want to listen. Hmm. Don't be fooled. Jonah is not the only one who's on the run from God. Again, the question for us isn't so much whether or not you and I are on the run, but I think a better question is, in what ways do we tend to run? In what ways? To what extent? And in what ways have we heard the word of the Lord and turned and run, fled the presence of the Lord? What about you? Uh, Sitting where you are. Maybe you're hearing this and you're not sure what to think about God in the first place, if there is a God. And if that's you, here's what Jonah's story invites you to consider. Could it be that the God who made you, the God who made the world and everything in it, the sea and the dry land, as it says in our passage, could it be that this God has already been speaking to you, that this God has already been pursuing you, already calling you to know and to love him, 
but that you, like Jonah, have been fleeing from the presence of the Lord? Could it be that God has actually made himself sufficiently plain to you, sufficiently plain, giving you all that you need in order to respond with your life in obedience to him, at the very least seeking him, seeking to know him, seeking to follow and to please him, seeking to do what honors him? And if so, may I ask, what are you running for? What are you running for? If this God has, in fact, made himself sufficiently plain to you, but you're on the run from him, you're not seeking him, you're not seeking to please him, to walk with him, what are you running for? What in your life have you so valued that you've allowed that to come before a relationship with your maker? Reputation, perhaps. Doubts that give you something of an excuse to not face your own responsibility and accountability to the God who made you. Moral freedom to do whatever you like. See, the lie is that in running we find freedom. This was certainly the lie that Jonah believed. That in running he'd find some kind of a rest, some kind of freedom. But as Jonah teaches us, there is no rest for the runner. None, but only in the presence of the Lord. And then for those of us who are Christians, who are doing our best to to listen, to hear, to heed to God's word, we might consider much the same. What are the things that God has spoken to you, to us? The things that we've heard and still have turned from? Maybe he's asked you, to give up a particular relationship, to set boundaries. Maybe he's asked you to speak openly and honestly with a friend rather than speaking behind their back. Maybe he's asked you to say something encouraging to someone that you love. Maybe he's asked you to take a step of faith in sharing good gospel news with a loved one or a neighbor, a classmate or colleague. Or maybe he's calling you out of an ongoing pattern of sin, envy, or lust, bitterness, gossip. What is it for you? See, every day we're confronted with this option, to heed the word of the Lord or to run. And when you run, we might ask, where do you go? What is your Tarshish? It could be many things. I'll tell you one thing it is for me. Well, my whole life, I have certainly loved the approval that comes from people. And there have been times, many times in my life, when approval from friends and my faith convictions have come head to head. And times when, rather than allowing my faith to win the day, to be faithful, to trust and to love the Lord, I've allowed my desire for approval from others to be my priority. And in these ways, flee the presence of the Lord. Turn away from doing the very thing that I know that God is calling me to do, to say, to be. What about for you? You see, church, we too are a people who have heard from the Lord and turned from the Lord. We are a people who, in greater and lesser ways, are on the run from God. And the question we might ask is, what does God do with people such as us? What does God do with people who hear the word of the Lord and run? But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Verse 4, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. As it turns out, the Lord is not indifferent to Jonah's running away. It's quite something. And he isn't indifferent to ours either. And there is a particular word here for those who belong to the Lord. All of us who have been baptized, marked out by the Lord through faith. And it's this, that the Lord will not let you off easy. Be warned to all God's children. He is a God who comes after his people. 
You won't be let off easy. He's far too committed to his children. So if you do choose to flee from God, from the presence of the Lord, you can be sure of this, that the Lord will come after you. And one of the ways that he does this, as we find in the life of Jonah, is through the storm. Through the storm. What did you think all those sufferings were about in your life while you were on the run? Who did you think sent the storms in the first place? But the Lord, we're told here, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Now, I should be clear about this because I don't mean to suggest that every bit of our suffering happens as a consequence of us running from God. Uh, if anything, the book of Job gives us the exact opposite message. Okay. Uh, it shows us that our suffering happens not as a tit-for-tat relationship with God, that we run god sends sufferings. If the, if the book of Job shows us anything about suffering, it's precisely that this is not how it works. And yet, the dynamic that we see here with Jonah where God himself sends a storm, suffering, trials toward his people for their good. This is all over the Bible. It's all over the Bible. It's what God does. He disciplines those he loves, cuts off that he might restore. He prunes branches that they might bear fruit, hides his face, but not forever, afflicts and binds up, wounds and heals, sends storms and quiets waters. And in all such stories of these stormy sufferings, we find that of this we can be sure. God, our God, is absolutely, 100%, without a doubt, committed to using all such storms and sufferings for our good and for his glory. That for whatever reason, and this is something that I cannot explain, but can only observe. The Lord has foreordained, he's seen fit to use storms, often surprising and confounding amounts of suffering, some of which, some of which some of you in this room know all too well. But that he's seen fit to use such storms to cause his creatures to turn to him, to trust in him, to be refined by him. Though Jonah flees from the Lord, the Lord doesn't let him go but sends a storm to stop him. And as we'll see, he sends a storm to call him back, to call him back. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Again, an amazing thing here, that our prophet Jonah, who had been running from God, now here, in this part of the passage, when everything comes crashing down, even while on the run from God, is instructed to call out to his God. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? Call out to your God. What do you make of this? What's amazing is that even in running from God, God is still his God. <laughs> God is still his God. And maybe, maybe somebody here needs to hear this. That though you are running, have been on the run, though you're on the run from the God of your youth, the God of your parents, maybe the God of your, your grandparents or great-grandparents, that even though you've run from him and may continue to run, still he is your God. He's the God with whom you have to do. He's your God. And when crisis hits, when the storm comes, even though you've been running, God is still your God. He's been with you. He's never left you. Still is with you, even in the storm. So we found that our God speaks to us, all of us. Has spoken, is speaking even now. And now the question that we're faced with is this. Will we heed the word of the Lord, or like Jonah, will we run? Now let's be honest. We are not better than Jonah. When we hear the word, especially a hard word, not one of us listens every time, obeys every time, follows every time, 
we just don't. We love what we love. Ease, reputation, status, approval, things, and more things. And when God gets in our way, all too often we run. And what's even more shameful than any of our collective acts of disobedience in these regards is that the, the ultimate word of the Lord, uh, the word of the Father, the word made flesh, the word incarnate, Jesus Christ in history, when he comes to us, we run. This is the story of the scriptures. This is the story of the gospels. Right? God's word made flesh comes to us and we run. We reject him, Jew and Gentile, enemies and disciples. We all together the Gospels uh, uh, have a unified message that all together, it's not about uh, his disciples abandoning him or his enemies or about the Jews or about the Roman uh, powers that be, but it's everyone. Right? In the end, everyone turns from God. Everyone turns from the Christ. Everyone turns from the word of the Lord and goes the other way. This is the human story. But there is good news yet for all of us traitors and infidels. For the runaways and the rebels, we've got a friend in Jonah. His story is good news for you because it assures us of this. That even when you go your own way, the Lord, the Lord will find you. And not in spite of the storm, but even in and through and under the storm. He tests us every moment, Job says. He commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts the waves of the sea, says the psalmist. And he sends this storm to swallow up the wisdom of men, that they might be delivered, says the psalmist. And so to all God's runaway children, he's coming after you. He may take you through storms, but he's coming. And how do you know? How do you know he's coming? How do we have any confidence that God so pursues the runaway? Well, here's how. That jo though Jonah heard the word of the Lord and ran, and though we've all heard the word of the Lord and ran, there's one who heard the word of the Lord and obeyed. And his name is Jesus. And where Jonah fails, Jesus succeeds. Where Jonah refuses, Jesus goes to Nineveh. He preaches to the nations, preaches repentance, sets the captives free. See, Jesus is nothing less than the new and the greater Jonah. And all of this is foreshadowed right here, I would suggest, in verses 5 and 6. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we might not perish. And little did Jonah know that centuries later, another prophet would find himself with mariners on another boat, asleep in the midst of another storm, awoken by frantic men, called on for help. But this greater Jonah, Jesus, would not cry out to his God, but would speak himself to the storm, be still. And what's more, for Jesus, the greater storm was yet to come. It would happen on wood of a different kind, not on a boat, but on a cross. And on the cross, Jesus would call out to his God that perhaps the God would give a thought to us that we may not perish. See, Jesus is the true and greater Jonah. You and I, like Jonah, we run. And the good news of the Christian faith is not that you can do better if you try to live a better life. If you're always obedient, then God will be pleased. No. The good news is that Jesus has done it all. He's done it all. He's pursued us. And the judgment that you and I deserve was taken on by Christ himself, the one who himself was cast into the depths of the earth, even to perform what Jesus himself calls the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, Jesus says, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus, in the end, is the one who faces the ultimate storm of God's wrath for us, that we might have peace with God through his work. He is 
the true and greater Jonah, the one cast into the depths of the earth and raised again after three days, that you and I might have life in his name. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the good word that we have and the ways that, well, not just Jonah, but the stories of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, testify to who you are, to who Christ is and all that he would be. And Father, we ask that you would encourage our hearts with the good news of Christ, who has come for us, who has sought out a people who are so prone to wander, prone to running. And Father, we find it to be good news that you're a God who pursues us, even those of us who run away, who rebel. And that in Christ, we find redemption and peace, forgiveness and life in your name. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, I understand this is a Q&A time. So, good, I got, I got one question in. You better get some more in quick because uh, otherwise I just got one question. I'm just gonna talk a long time over one question. Oh, good, I got another one coming in. All right. Uh, the question is this, how many times will God let us run away before he gets tired of chasing after us? Six. Um... Uh, it does make you think about that 70 times 7 question, how many times you ought to forgive somebody. Um, yeah, if Jesus demands that, if Jesus tells us that we ought to uh, forgive an innumerable, uh, you know, the point of that is, of course, yeah, how many times are, uh, am I ought to forgive uh, my brother? And Jesus tells them, not, not seven times, but 70 times 7, right? The idea is like an innumerable amount of times. That's, that's how often you're called to forgive. I, I can't imagine that God would have a, higher expectation of us than he'd have for himself. He is the God who forgives an innumerable amounts of debts. 
He's the God who comes after us time and time and time and time again. So I don't, I don't know that there's a number, a number to it. Uh, he'll come after you. I mean, obviously there is a dimension to, um, to us being able to resist uh, and, uh, and reject God and his grace. Uh, but for all who are his, for all who are his, uh, he's coming for us. This is, uh, this, is a, this is a promise. He's coming for us. I don't think he'll grow tired. Uh, how do you recognize what is the voice of God? Yes, right. I did say that God speaks, didn't I? And is speaking. Um, how do you recognize? Well, the scriptures is a good place to start. Maybe a good place to end. <laughs> um, uh, how do you recognize? Yeah, I, I think um, in terms of uh, where we're expecting to find an, uh, a clarity in terms of what God has said, certainly uh, the scriptures uh, and the word proclaimed, uh, church is a good place to be, uh, where the word is proclaimed to you, where you can have clarity about what it is that God says. Uh, I would say if you're asking the question more about uh, personally discerning what it is that God is calling you to do on a, a, a particular um, topic, I would say that there are many things that the Lord chooses not to reveal. Um, that the hidden things belong to God. But that which is revealed belongs to us, uh, revealed belongs to, to us and to our children, the scriptures say. Right? Um, there are things that God has chosen not to reveal. And actually, I think it's unwise for us to go chasing after uh, many of the things that God has chosen not to reveal. Uh, he's made us in his image. He's given us gifts like wisdom, uh, discernment. He's given us gifts of a family and community, a church community around us, the scriptures, so that we can search the scriptures and ask questions of people who know and love us when we're seeking godly counsel and advice. Um, but oftentimes, it is simply not God's will to tell us what to do in advance of doing it. Uh, that would be to live by sight and not by faith. Right? The Christian life is one of um, being called to live by faith and not by sight. Uh, not knowing what we're to do, and yet stepping out in faith and saying, Lord, uh, I'm trusting you. Lord, this seems good to me, and I, w I, w I want to do it. It seems right. It seems good. I'm going to step into it in faith that, that you'll honor and, and bless this. Right? There, there, there are many things that the Lord, for his own reasons, um, chooses not to reveal. And actually, it's very interesting the way that this happens. You know, the Old Testament has like uh, necromancers and fortune tellers. God specifically forbids those, right? Um, he forbids us to go to people who are going to kind of peel behind the curtain and see what is before us. Because again, I think that that's uh, antithetical to the way that God has actually called us to live by, by faith and trust in him. Taking the things that he's revealed, which are ours and belong to our children, and living a life uh, of, of faith. I, I probably didn't even answer your question, but I tried. Those are the only two questions I have in. Um, so that's, so that's that.